Um, kia ora everyone. Uh, as Rain said, my name is Lynn Matthews and uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming here um, on Zoom and in person. Um, and my dissertation was on data monitoring and the potentials of forestry 4.0. Uh, forestry 4.0, what is it? It's the real-time interconnection of a harvesting chain. Uh, its goal is a high level of operation of efficiency, productivity, and automization. For forestry 4.0 is broken down into four key areas, establishing a real-time environment, creating the internet of the forest, developing of current technologies, and the corrective action of live data, which is where my project comes into play. For my project, I was given access to live feed data of 44 different variables um, of a Valentini Yada. Valentini Yada's uh, mobile cable yard is a major yada manufacturer in Northern Italy who have implemented Forestry 4.0 in the yardas. My aim was to use these three variables, the carriage position, diesel level, and the revolutions per minute to find valuable um, outputs. The data that I selected was from a time period of one week of June 14th to the 18th. Um, you can see here it is accessed by the Promenium portal on the left, and that is an example of the carriage position. Um, I exported it to Excel where I did my data manipulation. Uh, firstly, carriage position. Uh, this here is the 14th of June. Uh, you can see that they started early just before 8 a.m. and finished up at just past 5.30. So straight away, the first thing that I noticed is we can get our scheduled machine hours. Um, you can also see those big gaps in the middle, uh, which is likely where they are having their breaks, having their lunch. So again, we can take those areas and take them off those scheduled machine hours and get our productive machine hours and our utilization. So for this day here, the 14th of June, um, the crew was productive for just over seven hours and had a utilization rate of 78%. Uh, going on from that with carriage position, I could break down each of those, um, I'll show you. The, each cycle, you can see the carriage going out. So out and back over and over. So I broke it down into individual cycles and their cycle times and their equivalent in extraction distance. So you can see for the 14th of June, the average cycle time was just under nine and a half minutes with the maximum time just under 16. If you compare that to the 17th of June, we had a cycle time of just under 11 and a half minutes and a maximum cycle time of just under 21 and a half. Uh, it's quite a big variation, but it's pretty explainable if you just look up at the extraction distances. We're on the 14th of June, they're pulling 486 meters which is 70 meters less than the 17th, which is 556 meters. From that, we could get a cycle time and extraction relationship. Um, as a bit of a reality check, um, if we extrapolate this relationship here, this line passed here down to zero meters, you can see that the y intercept would be uh, four. So the cycle time would be four minutes, which would mean that the unload um, Unload and hookup time of the logs is four minutes. Um, it seems like quite a bit, but if you compare it to uh, a study done by Reen Visser, the well, a Valentini Yada it had uh, unload hookup time of six minutes. So there is a, a two minute variation between that. And that could be explained by obviously crews or the fact that when I saw data um, that was sort of unexplainable, I would call it cleaning the data because you know it would be a breakdown or something like that and I wouldn't know. So I'll just remove that because it would just make the cycle times massive. Uh, fuel usage. Uh, you can see here, this is the 14th of June. Again, you can see the crews come in, work for a little bit, realize they needed to fill up, filled it all the way up to about 90% of the full tank. So 90 liters, worked all the way out through the day, realized just before they had to go, uh, about to go home that they needed to fill up the tank again. But they only fill it up about 10 litres and continue working. Um, for this day here, they use 62.7 litres, which equates to um, just under nine litres per productive machine hour. On average, they use 67 litres a day and just 
and it was the fuel use was about nine liters per productive machine hour. So next is uh, RPM. Uh, you can see on the left is the premium portal of the, um, the RPM and you can see it in three main areas, right up here working towards 2000 RPM here in that middle section up close to 1200 RPM and this last section here when it's working at its lowest between 800 and 850 RPM. I split the RPM ranges into 50 range, sorry, the ranges of 50 into bins. And you can see this in this bottom right graph down here. Most common range is that 800, 850 range where it spent 52% of its time. This was generally when it was idling. Um, you can see the second biggest, biggest range was out here at um, 1,950 to 2,000 RPM where it spent 7% of the time. This is when the carriage was either just hooked up or leaving the landing, so it was accelerating. You can see in this graph here, the next big section is these chunk of bars here, which is when it worked between 850 and 1,200 RPM, and that middle section back on that left graph here, which was equates to about 35% of the time. That was generally when it was just traveling, so when it had accelerated, and then it was just at a constant velocity. Uh, some extra results, the average cycle time for the week that I looked at was 10 minutes, average extraction distance 486 meters. The total extraction distance was 107.5 kilometers. The average extraction distance, uh, the total extraction distance on a full tank was um, 32 kilometers. The average cycles on a fuel, full tank was 65. Uh, the average fuel use per cycle was 1.5 liters and the average utilization was 85%. Um, in conclusion, I've shown it works and you can gain valuable information from the data, whether you're the manufacturer, manufacturer harvesting, harvesting crew or crew manager. The data can produce active, accurate costing, costing predictions and monitors. Um, also, if there was piece size data um, that was available, productivity studies could be done from distance. So poor people like us over there previously wouldn't have to go out in the cold and sit on the stopwatch for three days, measuring his harvest lines. <laughs> um, there's many more opportunities. I only use three variables. There's 44 variables available. Uh, it was mainly just time constraint. Future research and developments. Um, adding piece size data, like I said before, would get you those productivity results. So if you had that automated, which wouldn't be too hard to do, you could sit at your computer on Friday afternoon and your 10 crews that you manage, you could just go look and see what they've been running at the whole week. How much, how much, how many hours they've actually worked, how much, like, how much they've pulled and what their breakdowns and stuff were. Um, also adding video data or the possibility of on the land or in the harvest site, having a switch to flick like when the breakdowns happen or if you had that access to the camera data, you could tell when it happens. Because often in the data set, you would look at the data and it would be unexplainable. Like the carriage would just be unmoving for like, I don't know, like 20 minutes, which I would assume might've been a breakdown or well, I don't actually really know. And that was a bit of a limitation to the data. Um, like I said, yeah, developing that automated recordings of productive machine hours, schedule machine hours and utilization. And also developing notifications when your yard is working outside its normal range. So as we saw in the RPM, it never really got over that 2000 reps per minute. If it jumped above that, you know something was going wrong. I think it, over the whole week, it went over it five times and the maximum was 2004 RPM. So say if it jumped to 2200, you knew something was wrong. And then also finally is using a big data analytics or NoSQL databases. I was using Excel, which is pretty limited to its capabilities. If there's a lot better technology out there, with artificial intelligence that you could upload all this data onto it and it would do the analysts for you and find the relationships. Yeah, cheers. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Dylan. Um, yeah, questions. A couple of questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah I've got I've got a question. <laughs> oh, Keith Sorry, first Rob. and then Rob. Oh yeah, thanks, Rain. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know, excellent, excellent. Um, 
study there, Dylan. Um, you know, obviously we um, we can swim in in data, and um, and I guess you know the question I've got is you know what's the potential for for all of this data? Um, is it is it specifically more useful for the contractor in terms of his production monitoring and and that sort of thing and and the reasons and, and you, I guess you've explained that pretty well. Or is it more useful for the machinery supplier in terms of repair, maintenance, warranty purposes, like you say, um, notifications outside the normal range of operation? Or um, or is the data able to be um, transferred or or uh, transmitted to the forest manager? And and what what would be the potential for that? What what's your view on the on the use of the of the data? Um, I think it's valuable for like all three groups of people you said. Um, like I said, I sort of got sucked down a bit of a rabbit hole in looking at that productivity study sort of thing. Um, there's lots of other variables there that would be a lot more helpful probably towards Valentini and the Yada producers, like that RPM stuff I was doing. Um, for the managers, again, um, yeah, it's going to be useful just looking at the, how their crews are running, if they're running efficiently, if they are utilizing their time. And further on, like if that does get developed with uh, the piece size data, looking at how productive they are being. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Good, good study. Cheers. Okay, yeah, Rob. Oh, yes, um, yeah, again, good presentation, Dylan. Um, with, do you know if they were selective logging? Because the average haul distance is very high, like it's 400, 400 to 500 mm -hmm. meters. Were they um, over dead ground or were they pulling to a separate landing? A little bit more detail on the actual operation they were running would, would uh, perhaps put a bit more context to what you've presented. Yeah, that, that's the one problem and like sort of the limitation I did have is like, like I said, all I was, the access I had was to online. Like I was sitting at a computer accessing the data. I never got in touch with the crew. I never was, yeah, I never was in touch with the crew, so I didn't actually know what they're doing. And like I was saying, that sort of is that limitation. You're seeing this data and there might be variation in the data and you have no idea why. So it would, if I did know what they were doing, it would help out a lot, yeah. Yeah, sure. No, okay, thanks for that. Cool. And I should note, Rob, it's, uh, you know, Valentini is, uh, the yard is um, very known for longer extraction distance using multiple intermediate supports. Uh, and uh, with the Italian forestry, scenario often they're doing smaller patch cuts or thinning so they are um, less likely to build infrastructure like we might in New Zealand and much more likely to uh, pull line or use their skyline uh, to their benefit to, to extract those very long uh, yard of distances long extraction distances that, that um, would be the case actually <laughs> yeah like and, and I think Dylan made that good point if there was a video feed to go along with the data he could actually jump in on that 14th of June, June, July, yeah. June, and, and actually have a look and uh, reach out and see where they're at. But as Dylan said, he's focused on the data and the application of the data. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Brett? Uh, we're, we're seeing in uh, our trucks and our forestry vehicles these things called e roads, uh, electronic monitoring. Could you see this electronic monitoring um, in terms of operators? performance and, and, and how hard they are using the, the equipment like braking or you, you know those sorts of things or um, is that being a useful tool for, for manufacturing? Yeah I got you. Oh, sorry yeah Britt was just asking uh, like the e-roads that we have on a lot of our work trucks now um, you know could that be an application for uh, working with the operators the other operators? Uh, yeah um, well, I was, I sort of suggested potentially is that you could have like um, a little bit more control. Like if you flicked a switch saying like, oh, it's this operator working today or it's that operator or that person out there, then you could look and compare their like utilization rates and like how hard they are running at, what RPM they're running at. And then, yeah, I guess, does that answer your question or? Yeah, it does. And probably as a training, potentially as a training for yeah. <laughs> So Trevor Best just pointed Avatar, which is a larger research program in Europe. I'm familiar with that. 
Um, so yeah, that, that they're looking at this real-time data is also in terms of training operator monitoring. So yeah. All right, any other questions or comments? Uh, I'll chime in. Oh, sorry, uh, we've got, um, sorry, Joe, yeah, Joe from, from the uh, Zoom audience. Sorry, and then we'll jump to Karen and then we'll wrap it up. So, hey, I just, I find that that data collection to be extremely useful. Um, the so much job site management on the yarder end is anecdotal and uh, to nail down those parameters of anticipating the jobs that are like when you're when you want to deck at the yarder when you want to skid away and what kind of load count you can anticipate at the end of the day and then like you said also that it, it just really nails down the anecdotal information of you know the question on the last part of yarder study of when to what the effects of bunching and stuff is you know this really pulls together what's working and what's not on a yarder side so that you can adjust the rest of the crew around it accordingly so i i was pleased with what you presented okay so i think that was more of a comment than yeah. a question dylan uh so i know that uh joe ran cable yard and cruise over there. He actually runs New Zealand equipment or he ran New Zealand equipment over there on the Eastern side of the US. But he's basically pointing out or, or, uh, or one uh, comment is that, you know, it's obviously really useful data. Instead of getting all of that anecdotal, I think this is what happening. Yeah. You've actually got real data. So, and just last question from, from Karen here. Yeah, part of what I've been asking is that, you know, when you're swimming in data, the work that you've done becomes important or So the the uh, tricky question from Karen here is uh, with regard to look, Dylan's looking at one data stream coming from the yarder, but is there an opportunity to cross reference that with other data streams to help explain when uh, the data perhaps isn't making sense from uh, pure analysis? Um, one thing I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're talking about, but like one thing that I didn't go dive too deep into, but like say for example when I was looking at the carriage position, if um, you know, for some reason that that was high. Well, I'm sorry, it wasn't moving, it was stationary. You could potentially look at other things like the drum pressures and like one of them might be high or suddenly switched on. But yeah, I, I didn't get too deep into that because, yeah. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much, Milton. Much yes. appreciated. Uh...